If you want to be truly good at what you're doing, I feel like you have to have a certain level of confidence about your work, even if you're not there yet. I think it's important to have a little bit of that perspective of like, no, I can do this. You're listening to Talk Dog to Me, a podcast and community dedicated to candid conversations around documentary storytelling. I'm your host and fellow filmmaker, Leia DeLeon, and today's guest is Lucas Cardoso. Lucas is a director and DP you need to know about. Originally from Brazil and now based in Southern California, he founded Astorias Co., a production company that creates stunning branded documentaries and commercials. His work is eye-catching, meaningful, and makes you wonder, how did he like that? If you're wanting to learn how to step up your gaffing game, this episode is for you. Thanks for being here. Of course. So tell me how you first got into filmmaking. What was like the first moment where you're like, this could be cool? I was working in the admissions office at my alma mater, Masters University up in Santa Clarita. And I was like trying to sell the school to students. And we, I just realized like I wasn't into video at all at that point. I never did video before in my life. I was 20 years old. So my boss said, hey, if any of you interns, if any of you like kind minions have an idea, um, just bring it up. Like, don't be afraid to like innovate and think outside the box. So I was like, okay. So I thought like, what if we had videos on each specific department with the professors and the students talking about their experiences? Like nothing crazy, but we didn't have that. And you were studying what at? Business marketing. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So it started, it started out more as like a marketing project than anything, but Basically, like she was super supportive and then our director was super supportive and they were like, write us a pitch deck. No idea what that was. Create a document. We'll present it to development. We'll think about it. And if it goes through, then if you can recommend this a production company to hire, that would be great. I created the pitch deck. I created like kind of what the project was going to be. I remember uh, the marketing coordinator at the time asked me, oh, what are you thinking for B-roll? And I remember Googling, what is B-roll? <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Look at you now. Um, so yep, look yep. at us. I wrote that thing and it went through. I recommended my brother-in-law, Kyle, which shout out to my director. My director was like, his work is great. We'll hire him. And Kyle has a really like deep and meaningful like story center approach to what he does in like the commercial world. He kind Would of you has say like that's a, how you learned a lot like directly through him. 100%. So that's the approach that he took. He lit his interviews beautifully. He lit his B-roll and he was thoughtful about every part of the process. And I was on set with him and I was just like the first time looking at that director's monitor and seeing the magic made like right in front of me. I was like that this is what I want to do. Like this is the best way to communicate. So you're 25 now. Mm -hmm. And so you've been doing filmmaking for five years. Sincerely, it's mm -hmm. been since the summer of 2019. So that's four years. Whenever I think about it, it's very comforting and humbling because like it's a career that takes, it just takes a long time to get good at. And it just takes a long time to like make stuff that you're truly proud of. Like I look at the content that I made, the videos that I made like, you know, two years ago and I'm like, wow, I wish I could ever see that again. <laughs> But that's how it always is. I always yeah. say that we should have like a viewing party of all of our original videos just to like feel good about ourselves because mm -hmm. we're so hard. Like it's always like you get to the next stage and you're like, oh, like I could be better though. Like mm -hmm. you have someone else that you're looking to their work being like, man, like that's amazing. Like I want to be like that. Mm -hmm. And then you'll, you never actually know when you're at that next stage. Mm -hmm. You can only have like other, surround yourself with other creators that are like, no bro, like your shit's amazing. You know, like, and that's why it's so important to have like people who got your back and be like, no man, like what you're doing is sick, you yeah. know? Yeah, and I've always had those relationships from early on. If you wanna be truly good at what you're doing, I feel like there you have to have a certain level of confidence about your work, mm -hmm. even if you're not there yet. Yep. So I feel like, you know, when I was starting out, I was like, man, I'm gonna do this video and I'm gonna crush it. It's gonna be the best thing ever. And even though I look back and it clearly sucks, like I think it's important to have a little bit of that perspective of like, no, like I can do this, you know, versus just beating yourself up all the time and being like, oh, well, I'm not there yet. I'm just, or cheered, like, you know, I'm an aspiring director exactly. or I'm an aspiring cinematographer. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. I'm not going to hire you if you're an aspiring anything. Mm -hmm. Right. But yeah. I wouldn't know the difference if I came to your profile and you just started calling yourself a director or DP, then I'd mm -hmm. believe you. Totally. So there's so much power in just like owning it, which is harder. Yeah. It's easier said than done, but yeah. it's important, especially in our work. Cause there's no like outside validation. A lot of people that I've talked to on the podcast don't have a film background. Don't, yeah. don't have, you know, schooling, which you don't necessarily need. Mm -hmm. And it's hard to have that. I am now a filmmaker. 
energy, you know? Totally. I think when you, when you truly own it, you inspire people who are close to you. When you're being prideful and a jerk about it, you turn people away. Mm -hmm. I think that's literally like the line between, between both, like pride and, um, and just owning it being confident so so help me fill in the gap between that moment that you decided to make that marketing video mm -hmm. and then when you decided to start a production company mm -hmm. I graduated college so like I I did that whole campaign it, it ended up being three videos I like helped produce as much as I possibly could with the little experience that I had um, my brother-in-law did most of heavy lifting but um, we base I basically like I think I got probably like 10 set days with him um, and a year into it, I was almost graduating. I was like, yeah, like this is for sure what I want to do. They moved me from admissions into the marketing department, gave me a Canon 5D Mark IV and said, here are all these events that we need captured, go get them. And from a very, from that stage, like I had fun capturing the events, but I've always wanted to do like, Hey, what if we do a story on a student? What if we do a story on an athlete? What if we like focus on this specific professor? Which is just funny looking back and being like, how in the world did I have that perspective going in? You know, it's where your curiosity is. You totally. know, it's like I think back to I was interested in being a journalist to begin with, and so when when I was uh, part of the Panther at Chapman, like the newsroom, I never wanted to do like hard news. Like mm -hmm. I always wanted to do the feature stories. Like mm -hmm. I wanted to interview the head chef at our cafeteria, or mm -hmm. I wanted to like. I always wanted to profile people. Like I, I didn't, I, I wasn't interested in like the regular news. People who have like that doc brain, I think just have that like natural curiosity toward people. Yep. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point. Basically like I got hired full time after I graduated to continue to do what I was doing. Um, at the school? At the school, yeah. Okay, cool. And then a couple of things happened in my life to where it ended up being like a better fit for me to work um, at a, an amazing church in Sacramento called Doxa Church that offered me a position, like a full-time position to run their video department, mm -hmm. which I say department, but it's really one person. <laughs> Isn't that how it usually is? Video Lucas. department of one. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> um, so when did you, so you move to Sacramento to do that? Yeah, so I worked at Masters for like two months, I think after graduating and then moved to Sacramento with my wife, her family's from there. At that church, they gave me so many resources mm -hmm. to do stories on their members mm -hmm. and different like basically like their faith testimonies the worship pastor there's awesome and he wanted good live performances mm -hmm. recorded yep so i was like oh man like i have good gear in my hands my brother-in-law was across the street with his rental company mm -hmm. they were giving the resources in the space and so it was a year and a half of just like making amazing content with amazing people and doing what you wanted to you know like being able yeah. to explore the different stories and go a little bit deeper mm -hmm. they weren't really like an event driven church they were more just like you know sunday mornings but they really loved stories they loved stories on people mm -hmm. and so it was really cool to have like still the ability to do that my wife got into nursing school at call it cal state san marcos mm -hmm. so we decided to pack our bags and and move again mm -hmm. um uh-huh which was all in California though. All, you know? in California. all in California. Yep. Were you nervous at all moving to San Diego being like, oh, it's like not LA though? Like, did you have any fears like that? No. No. No, because from, from the get go, I realized that you don't need to be in LA to make meaningful stories. It's just, you don't. So. I agree with you, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, this is why we're here, right? I mean, it's amazing. Our job is to make meaningful stories and you mm -hmm. absolutely don't have to be in a part you don't have to be in a metro area in order mm -hmm. to get that done if anything if you are located in a unique area that mm -hmm. makes you more unique you can tell more unique stories you're not yeah. saying you don't have access to the exact same people and stories as someone else does mm -hmm. so i think there's actually a huge need for filmmakers that are not in the traditional like film markets yep and so yeah we moved down i worked a corporate job doing video for four months, great company. Mm -hmm. um, but just realized very quickly that the whole corporate ordeal was not. Was that a video department of one again? Or a video did you department have... of one. Man, oh yeah. Why do people think that video is done by one person? I have no idea. I think it's maybe it's reminisced from like, you know, my parent recorded home videos with, right. with just them. Maybe, maybe they're fine. But that was a team of two. 
Mm -hmm. so, yeah, 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 yeah. At the company that you were, like the corporate company, were you mm -hmm. doing like product videos? Like what were you doing? Yeah, product videos mostly. Okay. Yeah, very specific product videos. Mm. So, because that's the nature of their business. Mm. Um, it was like telecom equipment. So it had to be like to the T, very specific. Basically like realized that it wasn't for me. Um, I did not want to own my own company. I wanted to work in house forever. And being in that space was kind of like, okay, I can either like kind of make something out of this or I can just give it a try. And it was kind of like, we don't have a lot of financial responsibilities right now. We're young, we're healthy. So I just decided to go and um, start my own production company. So basically what happened was like, I started reaching out to people, started trying to get a couple of clients here and there. And when I had two months worth of just like freelance work ahead, I, I quit. It was like some of the best decisions I've ever made. Why did you think that you would not want to start your own production company? Because I was an extremely anxious person. I was like an extremely like control freak, anxious. I had to know that something was coming in the next week or the next two weeks or the next month. And so I think it's something that's really cool to see in my life. And my wife will even, will even say this, that being a production company owner really forced me to just not be that way and realize that life is not like that for most people. And also to like feel the joy and the thrill of getting a really good budget, you know, mm -hmm. or feeling the sense of urgency from having a slow month. Like those are lessons in life that hmm. some people never get to experience or learn. That's poetic, honestly. We started our business and we wouldn't have our business if it weren't for Matt to have the idea because I think I'm in the same boat as you. And I still have my days where I am just like, okay, mm -hmm. like we are really slow right now. And I know that we're already committed to these monthly expenses, not only for ourselves personally, but for the business. And I'm learning all this business stuff along the way too, because I got my degree in documentary production. Running a business is a whole different thing, right? Mm -hmm. It teaches you to kind of like be okay and like live in the moment instead of like drive yourself crazy. Because if you drive yourself crazy, then you're actually not doing the things that you need to do in order to grow your business. Mm -hmm. You're driving yourself crazy. Yep. And then you're digging yourself a bigger hole. Mm -hmm. I started out just freelance on my under my own name, 1099. So the guy that starts, I started the story is with uh, Mike, great guy. He was like, hey, what if we start a production company and put a name behind it and try to basically like give it a step up from just, and people make whole careers in their own names. I think yeah. there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. But I think like in the storytelling point, when you're seeking stories and when you're, um, and when brands approach you to like tell stories of their customers or clients or whatever. And I love running projects top to bottom. So like we started Astorias um, and yeah, if it wasn't for Mike, I wouldn't have like, I wouldn't have thought in that direction. Mm -hmm. I would have been like, oh, I, I guess I can just, you know, do things here. Mm -hmm. And it opened a lot of opportunities from the get go, like having, just having a name. Totally. That alone opened so many, mm -hmm. so many doors, which is super cool. So when you started your production company, like what were those initial steps? Like what was your like thought process to, okay, like I quit my corporate job. Mm -hmm. This is my main income. How am I going to make this work? Like what was, what were some of those first things that you set up for yourself? Yeah. So I focused hard on getting a retainer, um, which took me, I think like two or three months. Can you explain retainer just in case somebody oh, doesn't yeah, know totally. what it is? So a retainer essentially is a contract. Um, that you make with a, another party that they are going to give you X amount of money over a certain period of time. So say like you get a retainer with a fitness like center, like a gym, they'll pay you like whatever, how many thousand dollars um, for six months and then they will be evaluated after that. So a retainer basically gives you a little bit of stability mm -hmm. um, and like kind of Sometimes the floor, sometimes the retainers are great. And yeah. it's kind of like almost all you need. Yeah. So you started with retainers. What were you like pitching? Like what was the retainer that you were pitching to people? Yeah. So um, the first one was an editing retainer with an agency in Riverside. Um, so that was just me. And then the second one was actually with the church uh, that I currently attend. They had a ton of like needs. Mm -hmm. um, and so I was just like, hey, I think it's better if we just organize this over the next six months. So that that really helped me like in that first year to have a little bit of sanity. Yeah. Yeah. What did, I'm just curious cause we did a little bit of retainers too before mm -hmm. and we did, this was like, we kind of have a background in like social media marketing or we did stuff like per month, but I think like 
per six months is really interesting because it, it just takes so long to make good content. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious like what, um, you don't have to go into like crazy specifics, but like what, what goes into like a six month retainer, for example? I mean, it is just when the, when the client has a list of things that they need and it's like all out the front, like all in the first lap of the race, you know what I'm saying? They're like, we need all these things. Sometimes it's just helpful to say, instead of doing, Hey, we'll do a 10 shoot day. Sometimes it's helpful to say like, Hey, like let's space this out and, um, do a little bit at a time. And we'll batch shoot some days and we'll like batch shoot some other days. But for the most part, it's just like spacing it out over time. So the quality doesn't suffer essentially. And usually people understand that pretty well. Yeah. That helped. And then I also got in um, through my DP who works at a church in um, Sun Valley in LA. Mm -hmm. They were doing a feature documentary. Mm. So they had me on as a grip. What kind of tips do you have for people that are covering their local church or like how to stand out from maybe some other content that you've seen like churches make? Yeah, I think a lot of content that churches make ends up being more about like how good the church is, you know, like, and it ends up being about the organization where the stories that you're actually trying to tell are about what God is doing in the life of a certain person. And where was that person before? Where are they now? And so I think it's like, and honestly, that applies across the board, focusing more on the person and driving everything back to, to Christ rather than just trying to make some sort of like church name. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. yeah. So. And I feel like that translates well to businesses too, right? 100%. So instead of talking about why whatever company is so amazing and mm -hmm. this company, this company, that, talk about like one of the people, mm -hmm. you know? And it's just such a simple concept, but I feel like so many people get like wrapped up in it of like, well, like we need to explain this or mm -hmm. like, aren't people going to want to know who we are? Or like, I don't know, there's like weird feelings around trying to get everything across. Yep. And then if you try and get everything across, you're actually not communicating anything. Mm -hmm. And like people relate to other people. Yeah, I get work every, almost every month with this golf company based in Orange County. Um, called Sunday Swagger and their marketing director reached out to me and he was like, Hey, we're thinking about starting this against the grain series on YouTube. And so we filmed a Dodgers pitcher. We filmed like a NASCAR pit crew member. We filmed like a junior golf prodigy. Um, we've told stories of like professional pickleball player. Yeah. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Very um, cool. and they're all ambassadors of their brand. Yeah. Um, we followed a caddy for two days in the corn ferry tour in Savannah. And all the stories are focused on who they are, mm -hmm. where they were, what they were seeking in life, how they got it, mm -hmm. and then how fashion allows them to express like that struggle, how fashion allows them to express their individuality, who they are. And they're wearing the polos throughout the whole thing. Yeah, of course. Yep. So it's just like... And how did you get... How did they find you? He was my roommate. Oh, okay. Small yep. world. Yep. Very cool. Yeah. Reach out to the people next to you, honestly. Like you literally never know. Even that's why like posting your work is important. You literally never know, mm. especially graduating from college. Like people go all over the place. Mm, very true. Very true. Yeah. You got to just be top of mind for people. Mm -hmm. People are so hung up in their own worlds that they like don't mm -hmm. remember. So you have to like keep posting, keep telling people what you're doing because yep. sooner or later, like one of your friends is going to be doing something really cool and they're going to know you instead of like another filmmaker. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. So that was like, my buddy was like, I can't think of anyone else, but you, and it's not a brag. It's just literally cause it's just top of mind. Like yeah, yeah, yeah. That it's, it's more of like, you know, we're all trying to conserve energy. We're humans. So <laughs> it's just like, who's the first person? Are they good? Great. Let's just do it. Yeah. That's and true. we were friends before too, which helped producing different things. Like I will literally just sit for a second and think I'll be like, okay, this job is for this. And I'm like, okay, off the top of my head, like who do I think would be best? And I go off the top of my head first. Mm -hmm. Like, yes, I have a database that I like keep track of people that I've Googled once or something or reach out to me once. But like at the end of the day, I am thinking of the people that I am seeing on social all the time or people mm -hmm. that I see in person or just who's made a good impression on me. Like it just always is that way. Yep. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. You and, talk about how you do your fun lighting stuff on in interviews because I feel like specifically in documentary, mm -hmm. like your stuff stands out to me on Instagram. Because... Thank you. I'm just going to piggyback. This was going to be my transition. So thank you for this. Yeah. 
I agree with you, and I would echo exactly what you're saying. So I'm yeah. all ears. So interviews are like my bread and butter. The reason why is because like my DP, Nate, um, he's an interview monster. Like the stuff that he sets up on whenever we're shooting um, it just blows me away every time. And I was really into interviews b before meeting him too. The reason why is because an interview for me is a portrait of a person. So when I'm setting up an interview, I want to set it up as if like, say, you know, oh, Nate and I joke that like we get into rooms and it's like the Marine Corps, like getting into like a, like a space. We're just like, all right, like there's this, this window, there's that window. What are we shooting light through? What is like, and then we turn and we transform a room and we have so much fun. So interview wise, first thing is 90% of the time we're looking for a Rembrandt lighting. So the loop on the nose and the triangle on the other side, here's a tip. If you close your left eye and you, or your right eye, depending on where you're keying from, but if you close your left eye and you bring your thumb till it reaches your peripheral. So like I can see it right here. If I, if I'm looking this way and I set my light right here, it will be perfect 45. Hmm. Hot tip. Hot tip. We're going to try that next time. Guess where I learned it? Where? TikTok. <laughs> <laughs> Nate learned it on TikTok. That's and amazing. And he passed it on to me. That's amazing. But, and then it's all about like adjusting also the height of the light. And then the other thing is ratios. So making sure that your background is not too far behind your subject. I think we found that like usually the lit part of the face we try to match to the hottest part of the background and try to keep things at tabs within that. What Nate and I do is we'll lift the room and make it usually flatter than we aim it to be in post. I've had lighting setups where I was like, oh my gosh, this looks so sourcey. That's another thing. Sourcey lighting looks like there's a light there. Like you look at something it's like, oh, there's a, there's a light dome somewhere in there. Lighting that's not sourcey looks natural, right? The room's just doing what it's doing. To make your light not sourcey, a lot of times you have to make your foreground and your background on, on a ratio level, you have to bring them closer to a 1-1 one, one, rather than just making one really hotter than the and other. And how do you achieve that? False color. Just monitor your false color. Make sure that you have um, that 65 to 70 IRE on skin tones and make sure that you're reaching something similar in the background. I mean, obviously, if you're going for a super moody, dark, just, you know, like night scene, that's going to be different. But for the traditional, like during the daytime mm -hmm. interview setup. Yep. Mm -hmm. You're usually going to have it pretty flat throughout. What If you were to like draw a diagram of how you do things, mm -hmm. like, do you want to talk through like where you usually put things or any like little tips that you, mm -hmm. you and your DP have learned over setting up a lot of interviews? Yeah. Your brightest light doesn't need to be your key light all the time. That's one thing. A lot of times, like we usually roll with a 600D and like three 300Ds or two 600Ds and uh, three 300Ds or something like that. Basically, we look for windows and we'll use our brightest light to shoot through a window and create that nice afternoon glowy like. And so the light here. is physically outside. Usually. Lights physically outside. And you are shooting through the window. Mm -hmm. So it's like you're just adding more sunlight. Basically. What light do you, like, what's like the least powerful light you can use? I think you can do that with a 300 um, or like an Amaran 200D. The problem is that like with a 600, you really get that punchy like shape. Um, and it lifts, it also helps lift the room. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Versus the 300, you kind of just get like the window streaks. But exposure wise, I've, I've found like... Unless the room is really dark, the 300 won't do like a lot through the window. And what kind of diffusion are like, what are you putting on the light when you're shooting it through a window? So if I'm shooting it through a window, I'm usually just doing like a Fresnel. Yeah. So I put a Fresnel on the light, just shoot it bare through the window because uh, you want it to be hard. So a Fresnel is like a lens. So essentially you have the aperture F10 for the 600. Um, you can use the, the Fresnel 2X on the 600. Just if it's at 100%, you'll see smoke. So I use the reflector a lot. Like sometimes I'll just use the reflector. All that you're doing with the Fresnel is like when the sun comes through the window, the reflector kind of is just a big spread. Mm. The Fresnel behaves more like the sun where it's like more controlled. And a lot of times we'll use the same lens, like the same Fresnel. Most of our interviews are either a light dome through magic cloth. Magic cloth is a diffusion material. 
So it's the equivalent to like a full diffusion plus a little bit more. So worth it. Sometimes we'll literally just shoot like a 300D through a reflector, like just through the reflector that comes with it, through magic cloth. And if you position that light right and your ratios are good, it looks amazing. It's soft, it's nice. Sometimes if we want like less softness, we just don't use the magic cloth, we just go like light dome. I would say 90% of our interview setups is a 600D through a window and then a 300D using the thumb rule through magic cloth, either on the light dome or just bare with the reflector. And sometimes we call it the ghost. This is a, it's a little, no secret, but when we don't have a lot of space and we just have like a light dome, we'll put the magic cloth over the light dome. Like it's a, you know, when you put like a, mm -hmm, something over mm -hmm. yourself and you're like, pluck holes through it yeah, and, yeah, yeah. and we'll put the magic cloth over the light dome and let it drape. That looks really good too. And that's the ghost. That's the ghost. How much time do you budget for your interview setup? Like communicating yeah. with a client, you know, mm -hmm. hey, we're gonna set up an interview. How long do you take usually? I usually try, so an hour is pretty quick for us, but we'll, we'll set up in an hour if we need to. Mm -hmm. Usually I try to do an hour and a half. That's like kind of like, if I can get an hour and a half, that's amazing. Um, anywhere from an hour to two hours. Mm -hmm. Like the documentary that I was in where Nate was DPing and I was gripping and gaffing, sometimes it took three hours mm. to set up an interview. The room's the boss. You want the room to do what the room does. So, like one time we were in a room in LA and the room was enormous. And we were shooting an, an Ari Orbiter, which is like an Ari light, like pretty big, pretty bulky, a 600D and a light mat eight which is like this big panel through a six by magic cloth just to like try to get close to what the room was doing. So like obviously in those setups where th the room can be really difficult and so you need to move things around, you need to like set deck. That's not even talking about set deck. You need to try different positionings. Like one time we got in a, in a house and we learned like the day before that the house was in an HGTV show, mm. like a decorating show. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So we literally got there put a chair down and put a couple lights through the window, did our light dome through six by magic cloth and boom, it was done. I like what you said about like the room is the boss. So let's say you're a documentary filmmaker, you don't have time to location scout all the time. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you're in a new location and you just, you have to get ready quick or sometimes even doing like a branded shoot, you might not get the chance to do a location scout. Mm -hmm. So you are really like judging a room when you see it. Like what are those, things that you look for, like what's the order, what's the what's the military uh, process that you talked about? This room, for example, I don't know if you guys can see it, but there's a window here and there's a window behind us. If I shoot straight against the window, that's a lot that I'm fighting. I basically follow the lazy path in these situations, basically find the most aesthetic area that I can control the best. And windows are just a huge asset to make it look good. I don't have any sort of obsession with windows. It's just like, it's so easy to make a room look good shooting through it. So you love windows, is what you're oh, I love windows, man. <laughs> They're just, love them. Basically, like get in a room, find the most filmic aesthetic corner of it, sit someone down and start pointing your camera. If you don't start pointing your camera and you're on the crunch and you just keep trying to look for some corner without pointing your camera, you're in for a bitter surprise whenever you've found something. Because when you've found something without pointing your camera, you're, you didn't find anything most of the time. Yeah. Um, so get your camera out early because the mm -hmm. camera... Find the frame. Find the frame. And also just like stick to it. If you don't have time, find your frame and stick to it. You can make other interviews look gorgeous. Yeah. A lot of, which, yeah. which of your interviews that you've done is like your favorite or like your most proud or funny story or kind of however you want to take it. But like, yeah. if we want to dissect like an interview setup. There was an interview that we did for a cycling documentary in Pennsylvania. We were going to do it in the living room. And then we went to do B-roll of one of the cyclists and their trainer. And his basement had this like beautiful burgundy hardwood floor and kind of tallish ceilings. It had windows all the way through it. It was a long room. And I looked at my DP and I was like, dude, I think we got to do the interview here. I remember we did a 600 outside shooting on the floor. It was winter mm -hmm. and we shot it on the floor and it created a streak across the entire room, across the redwood floor. And it just looked like the most gorgeous winter light ever. And then we added a 300 to like kind of supplement it on the rest of the room and exposure 
was the exact same and it looked the exact same from sunrise to sunset because wow. we were there the entire day wow we just looked at each other like we made some some magic today and it was fun what kind of advice do you have for people that are maybe working together for the first time, like a director and gaffer or like DP and gaffer? Like how, how do you navigate that relationship? Maybe if you, if you don't have like a great relationship to begin with, or you're just meeting them or I don't know, someone that you don't have like a bond with to begin yeah. with. Well, make sure you get along. F f like funny story in that same interview day, Nate and I forgot the tripod the day before in the middle of the road in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. And it was we've all left we've all left a tripod somewhere uh -huh. one of mine is in sri lanka somewhere don't know where it is i really miss it it's beautiful i wish i had it oh, it's, it's so a perfect cool. travel tripod it's gone so anyways we get to the interview the next day and we look at each other where's the tripod and nate found it because he took a picture like a bts photo of it the day before we went back there amish country in pennsylvania was still there in the same place just frozen and wow. so we left it to thaw we thawed our tripod by the fire while we set up Wait, that's amazing. Yep. Yeah, Nate and I really get along. We were traveling together for, you know, we were together for five days. The crew is just the two of us. Um, if we didn't get along, we would have started some crazy blame game. So I think the main thing is getting along. The other thing that I would say is find out what inspires them the most and what kind of content they want to create. Because when people work together well, I usually, especially in the director DP scenario, I found that it's because the DP wants it almost as bad as the director to make the vision come come to life um and to see the story through and the director wants the dp to be stoked i'm a dp too believe me like a frustrated dp is one of the most annoying things ever when i'm on the dp chair though i want the director to feel so stoked like oh my gosh i'm getting my story mm -hmm. um so really it's just being a teammate like being a team player and, and making yeah, sure you have that same vision like you were saying like yep that the, the same, your creative like energy has mm -hmm. to match. Cause if your vibe is totally mm -hmm. different, then they're, you're not gonna be able to kind of maybe see things in the same way or get excited by the same thing. And sometimes like, say there's a project where, you know, the director wants it to be four, three, locked off, every shot's on a tripod, and that's how he's gonna accomplish his story. The DP goes into it because they didn't communicate thinking that he wants like, you know, like 239, like anamorphic handheld, like kind of pointing the camera all over the place, they're going to clash mm -hmm. and they're not going to be stoked. Mm -hmm. Now, if the director helps the DP to see the value in that format and the DP gets stoked about it, then you're in for a treat. Yeah. Yeah. So. Tell me, tell me more about the cycling documentary that yeah. you're working on. So two weeks ago, we, we wrapped production. We were in, in Pennsylvania for a week, six months ago, doing character development. It was basically eight cyclists who raised half a million dollars towards anti-human trafficking efforts for a specific organization called Zoe International. One of the main problems with human trafficking is lack of awareness. People think that it's something that they can't do anything about. So these guys are raising awareness and raising funds to rescue, restore, uh, to rescue and restore girls. Mm -hmm. essentially in LA, Thailand, Tokyo, um, and I think a couple other regions, but basically the documentary tracks, like it starts with character development around Christmas time, mm -hmm. which is really fun. Mm -hmm. It's them with their families, uh, getting to know each cyclist, which is each one of them is an amazing personality. Mm -hmm. And then, um, it goes into basically six months later, they, it's a race across America. So it's a team of eight, four cyclists and two 12 hour shifts for six days. And basically like you cycle for 15 minutes, rest for 45, cycle for 15, rest for 45 for 12 hours. And then your team changes. Wow. And those guys are putting themselves through the ringer um, just to raise money for, their, for those girls. And it's serious. The race is awesome as a cyclist. It's like, some people say that it's, you know, the Super Bowl of like endurance racing, but those guys aren't there to have a good time. Like it's, it's a really hard race and they all have like the girls' names written in their arms. Mm. I mean, the end of the race was one of the most emotional experiences I've ever had. So it's just a beautiful story about how ordinary people can join efforts to tackle an extraordinary problem. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And how, you said production's wrapped? Production's, 
pretty much. Well, well there's always there's always a little door that's always open, right? So well, there's a couple interviews and a couple moments that okay. we hope to capture. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So how did that project come about? So the in-house guy at that organization, um, his name is Mason. I DM'd him. I'm just like, hey, like I I like your work. Like we should get in touch and chat. And so we started talking, and he was like, hey, by the way, like. I looked at your the work that you did at your school and I liked the documentary style of it. We're doing this race across America thing. Like, what would it take to make a documentary on it? And I was like, are you kidding me? Like, so I sent him a quote and then his boss was like, let, let me get a hold of this. And she kind of like basically took the role of like an executive producer hmm. um, and did a phenomenal job at it. So yeah, it, the organization ended up funding like the entire documentary, which was a huge blessing. And they ended up getting other deliverables out of it too, which is cool. Amazing. Yeah. Are you going to edit it? Who's going to edit it? I am editing it. Ooh, nice. Mm-hmm. As, a, as a director, DP, and editor also, we wear a lot of different hats. Mm-hmm. Like, how do you know which project is worth doing that role? Or how do you place yourself and think of yourself like, oh, like this one would be good for me to direct. Ah, this one would be better for me to DP or Mm -hmm. this makes sense for me to edit. Like what's, what's, give me like an example or like how do you talk to yourself of like, how can I morph myself into like the right person for that job or know when it's not the right Mm -hmm. thing for you? This project, for example, there's so many moving pieces and like Nate and I were together for five days in Pennsylvania. And then we like raced with the team for six days with so many production days. Like I shot most of it with the storyline in my head and the documents. And like, I wrote a visualizer. So I think I'm kind of in a good position to just go in and, and edit it. And you'll probably save time. Cause it's, you were in the field, you know, your shots, like, you know totally. what you're trying to accomplish. Like if I was just to explain to someone, like, hey, so when we were in Kansas, like, I think that was day four, you know, like yeah, at yeah, 1 yeah. p.m., like this happened. It was really cool. <laughs> Can you find it? You know, like. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Do you take, uh, like, when you're out in the field like that, are you taking field notes every day? Or like, what is your process to help your life be easier later on? I'm writing, like writing questions throughout the entire time. Um, we do a lot of live interviews, like literally talking about interview setups, like a lot of those in in that cycling race there were no setups like all that i talked about lighting that was out the window during that week because we're not bringing a 600d and shooting it in the middle of colorado you know Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah in this case it was like the questions that i was writing to each writer as the days went by uh that was really helpful and then um the guy who reagan who was doing social media and like bts and driving us which bless his heart that whole week he actually did memory notes on the entire week like whenever something would happen he would type it down on mm-hmm. his notes mm-hmm. and you didn't ask him to do it he just... i didn't ask him to do it and he just did it and so we have all that and also they wanted daily recaps like little like one minute um recaps of what happened so i kind of i actually ended up doing full like basically my own version of dailies mm. um like every week at night yeah yeah yeah, yeah which is super helpful. Yeah. I think your story is so amazing because I feel like we talked about how you moved to the U.S. You didn't, you weren't necessarily thinking about filmmaking, but then it was introduced to you. And then it's only been like, what, like four, four years of you Mm -hmm. like fully dedicating to it. And I feel like you're so knowledgeable and uh, I really admire the work that you do. And I feel like a lot of people maybe that are listening or thinking about like, oh, like it would be cool to start a production company or like, Mm -hmm. you know, but they don't know like some of some of the things or they feel like insecure about it or like they don't know where to start. Or they don't think that it's like possible. But I feel like with your story, like mm-hmm. you just like went for it. Like, do you have do you have tips or like philosophies that you've fallen back on to like help you kind of keep moving and grooving and like improving your craft? Yeah. Uh, first one is meet with people that are where you want to be. Like just meet with them learn what it took to find out like learn find out what it took for them to like get there mm-hmm. and 99 percent of the times they'll tell you that they're not there mm-hmm. you know yeah which yeah. is a very humbling like experience um so i think number one meet with people um number two i was very 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 fortunate all glory to god for how quick i was able to learn what i learned 
because I was given gear and space to try things. A lot of people are not given those opportunities. Like I was working full time, I had a budget. You know, when I got hired at the church, we bought a Ursa Mini G2, we got a 600D. Like we got, we had like, you know, whatever, eight C stands. If you don't have that equipment right by you, find a way to get your hands on something. Like go to Lens Rentals and get your Christmas money, like 200 <laughs> yeah, yeah. bucks or whatever. Yeah. Rent a, rent a camera, a lens, and a tripod, and like go shoot something. Mm -hmm. You gotta have like a mix of like finesse and grit, mm -hmm. you know, to just go out and shoot your own stuff, mm -hmm. um, regardless of what it takes to do that. Mm -hmm. So, and then the other thing, third thing, is get on other people's sets, mm -hmm. like meet people, shoot your own stuff, and find a way to get on other people's sets mm -hmm. for free. If you have to pay to do it, like just, f just f find a way. I think those are the three things that, like, I would say just fell on my lap. To be honest, mm -hmm. like when I look back, yeah. Besides the meeting with people part, I was pretty intentional about that. But the the other two are just like so important. Yeah, yeah, amazing. Any other like uh, resources or I don't know, like tips that you wish you knew like before starting a business or even like becoming a documentary filmmaker that you think might be helpful to somebody else? I was really scared of like showing my work, show it to anyone and everyone. When I learned that lesson, there's been times where I look back and I'm like, why did I send that person that frame? You know, like they're not even in the industry. And I was like, dude, I just did this. It's really cool. But you literally never know. Like be excited about it and share it. The other thing too is just, I remember a conversation that I had with my brother-in-law and he was like, yeah, like I just heard from this other really experienced DP that it takes five years for you to make work that at the end of it, you're like, wow, almost nothing about this sucks. And I'm in, I'm in year four mm -hmm. and I can definitely say that the closer I get to year five, like it's, and five is not some magic number that could happen before or after. Mm -hmm. But I think the main point of what he said is that like remembering that it takes time for you to achieve the style of your favorite director you know, Absolutely. of your favorite cinematographer. It's not going to happen. Yeah. Yeah. It's not going to happen like overnight. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Thanks for being on the podcast. Thank you for having me. This was so much fun. That's a wrap on today's episode. Thank you so much for listening and or watching. I hope you found this useful. If you did, give us a rating. This will really help us grow our audience and better serve you. Also, if you love talking docs, join our weekly Discord Wednesdays at 5 p.m. PST where we discuss a doc of the week and check in with each other. Talk soon.